stand and worship tonight. salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in a crucifixion, by his blood I have been set free, I believe in a Resurrection, hallelujah, his life is just a free. And all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and Jesus mighty name I believe I believe in the hope of heaven he's preparing a place for me I on what hearts imagine Ears have heard or eyes have seen. I believe that a day is coming. He's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning. See the lamb and rose are roaring lion. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son.
All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to Freeway Ministries. Uh, I'm JR. I'm an intern here at Freeway uh, in the Timothy Project. And we're just grateful that you decided to worship with us tonight. Um, so if you're a regular or this is your first time ever being here, it's our prayer that you walk out of here changed by the word of God tonight. Okay. At this time, we're going to take up a, a love offering. So everybody come forward to do that. Uh, so Freeway Ministry is a, a, is a ministry that our mission is to reach the, hard, uh, reach the hard to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? We are not a local church, but we're an outreach to the local church. So if you, uh, if you don't have a local church, I want to invite you to Crossway tomorrow. Um, but if you do have a local church, that's where we want you to put your tithe at, okay? But the, if you want to partner with us and you have that ability, I'd, we want you to do that too, right? So <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and pray. Father, we're just thankful for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. Father, I, I bless this offering, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just use it to further your kingdom, Father. Lord, bless the giver and bless those that are unable to give today, Lord. But, Lord, we just, we just want to praise you, Father. Thank you so much for your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never So I'm not happy. 
I am an instrument of exaltation. I was born to lift the name above all names. You hear the melody of all creation. But there's a song of praise that only I can sing. Who else is worthy? is worthy there is no
Amen. That's a wonderful song. I've never heard that song before, but I can sing it because it's full of sound doctrine. Who is worthy to open the scroll? A strong angel said. He, he couldn't do it, and, and there is only one, and his name is Jesus. And, and uh, what a beautiful thought. Well, welcome to Freeway Ministries. My name is John Stroop, and uh, I'm so glad to have you tonight. There's a lot of uh, familiar faces and some that aren't so familiar, and I just want you to know we're, we're very glad you're here. Uh, we welcome you. I, I pray that when you came here tonight that you felt welcomed, you felt loved, uh, you felt like we, we care about you because we do. And so if you need a Bible tonight, uh, we're, we're going to go into some preaching uh, through the Word, but if you need a Bible, would you raise your hand, and we'll, we got some young men that are going to give you some Bibles to hand out from our, from our middle school kids. And if you need one, raise it up in the air, and, and we'll make sure you have one tonight. Tonight is a, a double pleasure because you get to hear uh, the, the preaching of the Word and worship the Lord, but you also get to recognize a couple individuals uh, that have accomplished something great. And, uh, and, and we have a 12-month 12, uh, 12 uh, discipleship live-in residential program. And uh, we have two men that have graduated that program. Uh, and, and these are guys that we have gotten in their business. We've really peeled black, back the layers of their lives and addressed issues that not just sobriety. Sobriety is not your problem. Addiction is not your problem. Addiction is what you see. There's something else there that's a problem. And we get into that. And, uh, and you know... Because you can go to hell sober. Did you know that? And you can, you can be a sober criminal. And you can be a deadbeat sober bum and not, never work. Sobriety's not the problem. And so we, we get into more than sobriety. And these guys and gals, they, just, they work so hard in our discipleship houses. And I'm very proud of you uh, because it is hard work. You can go to another program somewhere where they don't hold you as accountable. And you can do what you want and sleep around and listen to any kind of music and act any old way you want as long as you're sober. And that's not our program, and you chose to come to us. And so I'm proud of you guys uh, for that. And I'm going to ask that Brother Casey uh, Merrick would come up here and grab this microphone over here. Uh, Casey oversees the men uh, for Marshfield and Springfield. And so he puts a lot of skin in the game, so I want to give credit where credit is due and uh, ask that you would um, uh, introduce these two that have uh, graduated. Amen. Well, we have, if Todd Melton and Paul Hines would come on forward, <laughs> amen, amen. So, um, Proverbs 20, 25 says that it's a trap to commit something rashly to the Lord and later have to reconsider your vow. What this world is starved of right now in particular is faithful people that are willing to honor their commitments. Whenever you make a commitment, even as to, as to another person, you've actually made a vow to the Lord that you're going to do something. And these men have lived that out. And so they've been, um, came in at different places. Um, I'm talking a little bit about Todd. He came here. Um, we had a men's conference, or a men's conference yet, at our uh, Crossway Baptist Church a couple years ago, and his wife dropped him off there. And he got started in the freeway program, but he never let go of his wife. He was holding on to her in one hand and trying to do the program in the other hand, and it didn't work out. And so he, um, he left. But we told him, hey, brother, if, if you need help, you come back to us. And, um, and he realized that the world was just the same out there. It didn't change. And so in a few short months, he came back and, um, with a different attitude. He trusted his wife to God, and he got a foundation here. He surrendered the things that was, like, dragging him out the first time that was hard on him became a blessing to him, and the year just flew by, didn't it? Amen. And so um, he became a house leader. He honored his commitment. His wife is in the process of moving down here. They're starting their ministry here together, amen. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. 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 And Brother Paul went the long way around to him. We tried to get him out of Greene County, but they wouldn't let us have him. So he went through the Department of Corrections, and, um, and he's the kind of guy who wants to get his money's worth. He said, I'm not okay with the 12-month program. Give me the 20-month program. And um, he became a house leader, and he stayed out there way beyond his commitment because he was helping us train up future leaders and getting that house in order. And it's been a blessing. He's a, he's a great man of God. He loves the Lord, and he, he's a soul winner. He goes after people. So excited to see what... Both of you guys have in store what God's going to do for your lives. So can we give them, yeah, just tell, the, encourage the people here with, amen. 
All right, I'm definitely not a man of few words, but uh, I'll try to make it short. Um, you know, I'm just, I've got a, a heart of gratitude right now. Um, you know, God has really changed my heart, my life. Um, I've got my whole family sitting over there. Uh, he restores all things. I just want to ask if you guys would stand up, the family that's come to support But today I get to be on the other side of my sin. Uh, today I get to walk in his joy, and I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm blessed today. Before, before you uh, take that, um, I want to give you this. Uh, if there's some money on that Visa card, so don't lose it. Uh, I think it's 200, 250 bucks. But this is from an old lineman's memory, a man named Charlie Jennings. Who, uh, who, who used to turn people's power off. And uh, whenever they had a small child and they was a single parent, he would, go to the, he would go to the electric company and he'd pay the power bill for them. And uh, his family serves here and uh, they, give, they give a little something every month to the fund and we make up the rest. And so here's $250 uh, for you to do whatever you want to do with it. And just we want to say thank you and we're proud of you, Todd. Very proud of you. Me and you got a lot in common. Uh, you don't have no family here, and but I want you to know you do. And I want to ask, I, listen. Love you guys. The church family is pretty much the only family I got. And uh, we're in the same boat. Just because your blood relatives aren't here to stand up for you. Marshfield, Cross, Crossbridge, and uh, Freeway Marshfield has drove here to see you tonight. So would you stand up to show your support, Freeway Marshfield? Yeah. Go ahead. There is no greater love than this, and that is a friend that lays down his life for a friend. Uh, the last 19 months, I have watched Crossbridge Baptist Church, Crossway Church, and all the other partnering churches along with Freeway Ministries lay their life down every single day to make sure we get it to our appointments, we see our parole officers, we learn what it is to have a savings account, how to move up in employment, not only just obtain a job, but move up in a job. Amen. I have learned, I'm 41 years old, I never had a car in my name, I never had a bank account with over a few hundred dollars in it. So this place is a very special place that trains you up and plugs you in to the local church. If you do not belong to the local church, if you are not saved tonight, you just saw the love that is given by the local church. It is for you. God gave his life for you. Believe it tonight. Enter the family of heaven, and I'll see you forever. These guys have really worked hard, and um, unless you come from our people group, you don't realize how much work it is to change your life when it comes to those things like criminal behavior and, uh, you know, paying your bills and doing things right and submitting to authority. Uh, it takes a true miracle, and so uh, I'm just so thankful. We're going to go through the slides real quick. Um, Woo! Can't get over this. Thank you, Lord. So if you, how many, how many people like free t-shirts? Awesome. Well, you can win one at Freeway Ministries, okay? This is a simple thing. We, don't, we like to make it complicated. So all you have to do is we're, we're live right now on Facebook, Freeway Ministries. Uh, you can either share the live feed. You can take a picture here. Uh, check in at Freeway Ministries. There's a little map sign for my friends that are senior citizens that don't know how to do that. Check in. Uh, that little map sign, Freeway Ministries, and then hashtag one broken life at a time. And share it. And make sure it's public and we'll find it. 
And uh, we love to pick new winners, and we'll give, you'll get a free new T-shirt. We have a podcast called One Broken Life, and it's a phenomenal podcast, and we explore the lives of individuals from the big mess to the big message. And these are our podcast T-shirts. We don't sell them. We give them away. And so I'm going to ask Thelma Van Hooser if you're here tonight. There you go. There you go. Thelma's uh, converted to freeway. She's one of our favorite people. We love her so much. She's the cook. She's one of the cooks. So she's a little bit like the lunch lady in high school around here. So uh, next slide. We have a uh, shower trailer ministry. I'm sorry the shower trailer's on mine. Uh, it's called Get Clean. And so every single Tuesday from 10 a.m. To, to 1 p.m., we give showers to unsheltered people here. Uh, we bust them in from, the, from, from one of the places in town that's a day shelter. And people, you can come, you can show up, and you will get a brand new pair of underwear and socks. And you will get some clean clothes, and you will hear the gospel, and you will get away off the street if you need one. We'll, we have resources and somebody to sit down and talk to you about how to help you get more than just physically clean. Uh, but how that Jesus can wash you clean, period, and, and save your soul. And so uh, it's every single Tuesday. Uh, if, if, if you guys would like to come and, and be a part of that, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, it starts, the kickoff is this Tuesday. And so uh, come join us if you want to volunteer and, and hang out with us. We'd love to have you. We'll have lunch together with them, and it's really, really cool. So uh, volunteer banquet, it's coming up May 7th. Uh, it's basically a time where we... We love on our volunteers, our board of directors at Freeway Ministries. We're a nonprofit. We will actually serve, our board will serve the meal, uh, help serve the meal to our, to our volunteers. And it's just basically, hey, this is what God has done. This is what he's doing. You, you, you help make it happen. It's just a really, really important night to where we, uh, we, we love on our volunteers and we show appreciate to, appreciation to them, our volunteer banquet, May 7th. Talk to your team lead if you serve at Freeway Ministries. You will have a team lead. If you serve here and you feel like, hey, I serve and I don't have a team lead, talk to one of us, me, Casey, uh, one, one of, the, one of the, uh, the folks here, get to me, and we'll make sure that you get to the volunteer banquet. Next slide. <laughs> we write to Pando. How many know who Pando, what Pando is? Okay. Amen. So we, our, our services are live, uh, not live, but uploaded to uh, what's like YouTube in prison for inmates. It's called God TV, and uh, our services are on 150,000 tablets in 100 different prisons through the United States, and uh, people, are, people are able to watch, and uh, we have an intro, outro video, and they write us, and so we, uh, we send everybody a newsletter, but also we need pen pals. Some of them are like really hungry. They seem like they're seeking the Lord. And so we, we really would, would, would like to write them individually. And we have some people writing like 10 letters a week. And so if you would be interested in being a pen pal for somebody in prison, there was a man who wrote me in prison. And if it wasn't for an old man who never quit writing prisoners, I wouldn't be standing here today. Uh, and so it's a very, very important ministry. And you can go to Jessica Mer Jessica at freeway.org, freeway-org. You message us, message us through the Facebook page and say, I'd like to be a pen pal. And we'll connect with you and see if we can help you facilitate that. Is that it? All right. So uh, I want to introduce my friends here. Would you all stand up from Chickasha, uh, Bible Baptist Church, Chickasha, Oklahoma. Uh, we, we've talked about planning a freeway right outside of Oklahoma City. You guys have heard me talk about that. Well, uh, they're here. Uh, Jason Blackshear, it looks like he's going to be sent off with his family. May 25th is his send off. And so uh, pray about supporting him and his wife. Uh, you can come, and, and we're going to take a love offering for him that night and um, try to bless him. My wife and I, we're, we're going to lead. We're going to give. Uh, I would appreciate it if you'd pray, if you're able to help support him. 100% of that will go to, that, to him and his wife so they can be freed up to do ministry. Uh, we're going to see God do great things all over the world. Uh, and it's, it's just exciting. And so um, 
as we close, I'll have you come in to say something at the end. Pastor Steve, don't let me forget. Wave at me or something. But uh, we, we ask that you turn your cell phones off here tonight. If you have a cell phone, please, 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 please. Uh, we're going to have the preaching of the Word of God. Let's not be a distraction. Uh, if you're the type of person that has to get up and down, up and down, maybe you have a medical issue. I'm not throwing stones at you. Be, sit in the back where you're not going to distract other people. Um, you know, you don't need to distract people. If you're going to talk about what's going to go on tonight and you feel like that conversation is really important, I get that. Go outside and have it. So people around you can hear the word of God. It's a big deal. The Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. You say, I just came for a meal. That's why we serve the meal first. Because if you're hungry and you just come to eat, you can have the meal and you can, you can go. It's okay. Um, no hard feelings here. But we, we just take the word of God very serious. And so... I'd appreciate if you could accommodate that for me. Uh, amen? amen? All right. So if you have your Bible and you'd like to turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians. The title of the message is Unity in the Body. It has been a great adventure. I don't know about you, but I've learned a whole bunch from just preaching and studying 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Unity in the Body. Uh, we're going to be in verse 24. So when you find your place, if you would be kind enough to stand to honor God's word as it's read. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually of it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, tonight that you're a good God who loves us and is involved in our lives. Father, we have witnessed a miracle tonight. Two of them. Two men. I can't say everyone's given up on them, but I know many probably have. But not you, Lord. You plugged them into the local church. They came to Christ and submitted to discipleship. And we're, we were able to work through the, 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 the dark underbelly of their life and help them sort out things and address behaviors and uh, I know Casey poured lots of time individually in each one of them men, and the local church came around them, and here they are tonight, Lord, walking the stage and graduating. Very thankful for that. And I ask God that tonight maybe there's somebody here in the crowd that feels alone, abandoned, if they're here. God, that they would know they don't have to have physical family with DNA in their, in their body, Lord, that we will be their family, that we will plug them into the local church, that we will do our best to find mentors for them, and Walk alongside them and be, be, be friendly enough to them to tell them the hard truth in their life. God, would you raise up an army out of our people group? People who would shake the world, outcast, nobodies, despised, rejected. Your word says in your wisdom, that's who you call. So God, tonight use me to preach your word like a dying man to a dying people. Help me be unafraid and brave and bold. And I'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. So as we kind of jumped into a, uh, the middle of a sentence there, in verse 24, Paul is finishing up what is known in the Bible as the spiritual gift section. And in the spiritual gift section, he explains how every single person is important to the church. And using, using that idea, he uses the analogy of a body. And, and in the analogy of a body, he's, he's talking about how important your members of your body are. And so when you hear him say members in there, he's, he's using an analogy of your body parts, the members of your body, the, their hands and your feet and your legs and your arms. And, 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 and so every member in the body of Christ, every member of the local church, Paul says, is important. 
Their unique giftings is ordained by God. The Bible says God has appointed the gifts. God has appointed those people. Uh, you, you don't really get to pick your spiritual gifts. God picks them for you according to Scripture. And so Paul explains uh, that no one is without, no one is, 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 no one is unneeded in the body of Christ. That every person is important in the body. That no one is unimportant and no one should feel like they're not important. And so people would feel less important that didn't have the speaking gifts. And, and people who had the different gifts that weren't in, on, the, on the stage or in, or in front of the crowd, uh, they felt less important. And let me kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Look at verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it not, therefore, of the body? If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. He's given an illustration of people who don't think they're as, poor, as important as other people. I'm not important. I'm not needed in the church. My giftings aren't as important as that person's giftings. I'm not vital to this church. I don't belong here. He says, is it, therefore, not the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole, whole body were, or if, if the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? Now God has set, see God ordained it. God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. So now Paul is going to explain here in this section of scripture how important it is to keep unity. Siri does this every time. Shh, be quiet. How important it is to keep unity in the body so we'll have a healthy church. Just like a body should be unified, a church should be unified, a body of believers should be unified. Corey Timboom, one of my heroes, said this. Be united with other Christians. A wall with loose bricks is not good. The bricks must be cemented together. If you think about it, when Paul writes this church, he's writing that every single member of this messed up church should be joined together like a body. And he mentions that we're to be unified. We are to struggle together, suffer together, be in honor together. And when it's time for rejoicing for one member of the body, we all should be celebrating in unity. That's what he's saying. So if the local church is compared to a body joined together, attached to one another, and dependent on one another, what happens if the body is not in unity? What would happen if my legs went on strike tonight and said, I'm done. I'm not the eye. I'm not the ear. I'm not as important. I'm not the speaking part of the body. I am not going to participate anymore. I would be stuck if my legs went on strike. As silly as that sounds, you would be surprised at how many people get sideways in the local church get angry at each other, get sideways with each other, and cause division, what Paul calls a, a schism. Something that, it's, it, it's really a word that describes tearing something in two. And yes, there are times when people can agree to disagree. You're not going to like everybody. That's just the way it is, amen? It's just part of it. You say, well, that's not me. I like everybody. You're the biggest liar in the building. <laughs> I'm just being real. I'm being honest tonight. I didn't come here to put on a show or be fake and phony. I come here to be transparent with you. There's some people that just get on my nerves. And there's some people that get on your nerves. But we still love them. And we're still kind to them. And even if we don't agree in the body of Christ for the kingdom of God, it's not about you. It's not about me. We can agree and dis to disagree. We can fist bump and we can still serve the Lord. And you can serve the Lord and where God's called you to serve the Lord. And I can serve the Lord where God has called me to serve the Lord. And we can build the kingdom of God together. There are times when folks have disagreements and, and get sideways with each other and there's envy and jealousy and competition in the church and in the body of Christ. And so what can we learn from this section of scripture that Paul is going to share with us? How can we obey this first century letter? How can this draw you and I to pray as believers in Jesus Christ? There's some simple truths tonight I'll point out to you. If you'll listen quick, I'll speak quick. Amen? Amen. So the first simple truth is this. We must care for one another if we want to keep unity. If we want to be unified, and I think you can look around tonight, you can see we are in unity. 
This is not the local church. This is the ministry of the local church, but we are the body. We are believers together. We all go to a church somewhere, most of us, right? And many of the people here that stood up and, and support each other, uh, we have to care. The word care in verse 25, look what it says. He says that there should be no schism in the body. And when you hear schism, I just want you to think of a, that's what that means. Tearing in two. There should be no division in the body. And so how do we keep from having division, Paul? But that each member should have the same care for one another. He's saying that we have to start caring about people. Billy Graham said this. He said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. We are called to care for one another. The word care is used in the New Testament, the same Greek word for anxiety. It's concerned. You ever get stressed out and worried about something, man? You, you, you get real concerned and you, get, you start thinking about that thing. And sometimes that thing can overwhelm you and take you over and get you stressed out. He's not saying be stressed out about people even though some people may stress you out. He's saying care about them like that. He's saying think about them like that. Maybe worry about them in a good way, you know. Send them a text message when God puts them on your heart. Get on your knees and say a prayer for them when you think about them. Ask them how they're doing. Remember their names. Pray for them. Shake their hands even if they come in and they're homeless and they got dirt and grime and grease all over them. And they go to shake your hands. Shake their hand anyway. Love them. Care for them. Show them that you care. People from our people group can spot a fake a mile away. They know when you are phony, you could be Billy Graham, Billy somebody, Billy Sunday. It don't matter. You can preach the best message in the world. And a homeless person, somebody who comes from my background, from the streets, can tell if you are phony one mile away. They know if you're fake. Don't be fake. Care about people. We're not supposed to be over emotional or put on a show. You're going to have some, you're going to care more for one person than the next because of your relationships. I understand that. But he's saying generally care, genu be genuine. God doesn't want one member of the body of Christ to be favored over another member in the body of Christ. God wants the church to care for each other, to be concerned for each other, to love each other, regardless of the giftings. The preacher shouldn't, shouldn't be loved more than the guy who takes the trash out. They should have the same care for one another. Some say, well, preacher... How come uh, so-and-so was in the hospital and everybody knew about it? How come when he got hurt at work, I seen the church doing a meal train for them on social media, and we never had that same kind of attention from that church, and I've been going to that church. I said people who are active in the local church and serving in the local church, involved in small groups, Bible fellowship, Sunday school class, are connected, who are there all the time and fellowship all the time, are always going to have a stronger concern for each other in a bond. You cannot expect people to know what's going on with you if you're not plugged into the body of Christ. You say, I was missing and no one said anything. You're always missing. That's why no one said anything. What's new? You come in when the worship's about to end and you leave as soon as the altar call's about to happen. You cross your arms and you sit in a pew and you say, bless me if you can. That's what my pastor says, amen. Hey, listen, get plugged in. Be like the employee of the month at work. Serve the Lord. Open yourself up a little bit. I used to be terrified of church people. Church people are just a little weird. I'm going to be honest with you. Amen? Can you say amen to that? I was scared. Scared to death. They're like the Brady Bunch, man. There's all these kids together. They got their Bibles. Everybody's just following along. They're dressed perfect, man. They look like they brushed their teeth real clean, and they got their hair combed over, and they're just in a, a perfect line like a bunch of ducks waddling to the aisle. I'm scared to death. I'm thinking they're going to find out how messed up I am and nobody's ever going to be my friend again. And, 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 and I, w I wouldn't talk to nobody and I wear a turtleneck sweater. And they say, why do you wear a turtleneck sweater in the summertime? I said, I like turtlenecks. <laughs> I was ashamed. But then I started to get to know them. I put myself out there, man. And I got rejected by some people, but not everybody. 
And today I found out that church people are just as messed up as I was. Just as messed up. If it wasn't for the church family, I pretty much wouldn't have a family. When you get plugged into the local church like the employee of the month, they know when you're gone. They care. You're missed. You're noticed. Everyone wonders where you're at because you're faithful. And they see you, and they got your phone number, and you're praying for them, and they ask your name, and you guys are connected. I preached revival in Ash Grove First Baptist one night and let this year, and and there was this little boy leaving with his daddy, and it, I'd been outside at the booth and sitting there for a while, and we had a great revival service, man, and, and everybody, you know, hanging out in the church, nobody wanted to leave, and, and the mom and the dad was taking this little boy, and this little boy was fighting the dad like a grown man. He was, he was probably four years old, and he was grabbing his dad's head and kicking and screaming, and, and he had a hold of this little boy, and he was wrestling this little boy and had him above his head. Little boy was like a spider monkey. If he'd have had the strength of a grown man, he'd have killed his daddy. I mean, he was, he, would, he was upset. And I said, what's wrong with him? He said, he don't want to leave church. He wants to stay. He wants to be here. He's willing to fight his daddy not to leave and hang out with his friends. What if we got plugged into the local church and we said, we don't want to leave. I belong here. This is the body of Christ. This is where the people pray for me, love me, lift me up to the Lord. We say amen to the same things. We got the same views on life, man. We are in agreement. Praise God. The local church. Getting plugged into the local church. There was a man named Dave, disabled. He had a walker. He was a retired nurse. Lived on a, a fixed income, didn't have much. But he'd come here and sort clothes. And he said, I, he said, John, I really can't do much, but I can hang clothes pretty good for my walker. Could you use me? I said, absolutely, Dave. You kidding me? So Dave would come on Tuesdays and we sort clothes and he'd have his walker and he'd sit his walker down there and he made it a point to outhang every strong person in the entire building. And he sorted clothes and he hung them up quick. And one day I seen all the, 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 the clothing team by the door and they were all upset and crying and upset. And I said, what's wrong with you guys? They said, Dave didn't show up today. They knew something was wrong. They were crying before they got the news that he went to be with the Lord because they knew, they knew Dave. And they knew him so much and they cared about him so much they knew that Dave would never just not show up to serve. Let me ask you a question tonight. How do you expect people to care about you and know you and get involved in your life if you're here just every once in a while? I'm not trying to guilt you. This is not church. This is not the church. This is an outreach on Saturday night. Saturday nights are very busy. I understand that. I'm glad you're here. I love you. I'm so glad to see you tonight. I'm not guilting you into anything for Freeway Ministries, but you need to be plugged into your church, man. Somewhere. You need to get there before the worship starts. At least the first, get there by the first song. We're coming in hot. We got a little four-year-old. I'm coming in the parking lot. My wife is late for every single thing we do. I'm just going to tell you tonight. I'll be honest with you, okay? But we make it, and we stay for the invitation, and we don't get up and down and up and down and go use the bathroom 500 times during the service. I tell my kids, you better go to the bathroom for the service. If not, you're going to pee your pants. You say, that's not right. They sit through a video game for two hours, but they can't sit for 35 minutes at church. Are you kidding me? We, we have high honor to the church. We love our church. We want to respect our pastor. We want to have our journals and our Bible and our notebook. We want to sit down and study the Word of God and be washed by the Word of God. I want to sit on the front row and say, amen, preacher, I hear you. I'm with you. Preach the Word of God. We are here with you. Teach us. We come to eat on the living Word. You say, I'm mad and I'm leaving. You're going to get more mad as we go, so you might as well get up and go right now. It's going to get hotter in here. <laughs> I want to tell you tonight, relationships go two ways. Two ways. You can't expect people just to do all the caring, all the calling, all the visiting. We have to get to know each other, sit down together, break bread, study the Bible, learn about each other, laugh together, cry together. 
suffer together, celebrate together, be present in each other's lives. One person can't handle everything, but together we can do it, man. Together as a group of people, we can really make an impact just by something as simple as saying, hey, man, how you doing? Look at a man in the eye that comes through the door and had a rough day. I already know how you're doing. I read your body language, but I care about you. I want you to know, I, I want to know how you're doing. We do Christmas together around here. We do Thanksgiving together around here. We do Memorial Day together around here. We do the Super Bowl together around here. We celebrate our birthdays around here. We do baby showers around here. We do wedding showers around here. Amen. I've had people come through the program, and just like me, I never even knew what a baby shower was until I got saved and got introduced to the church. What was a baby shower? What's a wedding shower? You read books to babies, really? Didn't know that. I mean, you're, you're, we're reaching people that don't understand these kinds of things. And when somebody cares about them, man, remember the context here. Paul is rebuking the church for misusing and abusing and fabricating speaking gifts. And some people in the church felt mistreated because they were, the wealthy would come to the fellowship meal and they would bring the food and they would eat the food before the poor people got there. And the poor people di didn't have anything, and they felt unimportant, left out, neglected, and it was causing division. We're called to care for each other. How do I do that, preacher? Here's simple truth. Listen to this. When you care with someone, you suffer with them. Suffer with them. Suffer with them. Look what Romans 12, 15 says. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Here's a unity word. Be of the same mind towards one another. Don't set your mind on high things. Associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. My wife and I, we have a blended family. At my house, there's Zenly, who's four, and Keith, who's 16, and Charlotte, who's a little older than I am. And... Uh, And by marriage, I had, I, when I got married to my wife, I had an 18-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son immediately. And uh, my 18-year-old daughter has a, a foster son named Malachi. She's a school teacher in Savannah, Georgia. And they were in, and she has a phobia for storms. She's terrified. As soon as she gets to my house, she looks at the weather app. And, I mean, it drives me a little crazy, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> but I try to be nice about it. Well, the last tornado deal we had, anybody remember that just recently, not too long ago? Well, I live in the country, 27 minutes from this building. The wind's different in the country. I don't know if you know that or not, but it just is. And she, that morning, she said to me, I think we got a bad storm coming tonight. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> so my wife wakes me up, and she's got the radar. Ashlyn texts her from the guest bedroom, and she wakes me up. It's about 11 o'clock at night. It's torrential rain, and she says, uh, the tornado's headed our way. We need to go to the shelter. And the shelter's outside in the back, you know, outside probably 100 foot from my back porch. And everybody's asleep. So we got up. I got this little poodle dog for my wife. She got the poodle dog. Keith got the poodle dog. I wake my son up. He don't even know where he's at, man. He's, he, I'm, you know, he, I got to get him up. He's 16. I got him up. I got my little girl up out of the bed. She's wrapped in a blanket. I give Keith a little poodle dog. Uh, Ashlyn's got Malachi, who's not two yet, and Charla is walking and, and I open the door and I lead them out and I had already went down into the uh, the storm shelter and got it all ready and the, earlier that day I just had a feeling we was going to be in there and uh, I mean torrential sideways rain I'm holding the door open we get them down in the shelter and I give Zinley away and I shut his and hatches in and then when the storm goes by and the radar says we're clear I get everybody out and then I open the storm shelter and I notice that my shop door's been blown open so I turned to walk and shut the shop door. I got my four-year-old in my arms, and she's a big four-year-old. And I shut that door, and when I turned, I forgot about these cinder blocks in the yard. It's pitch dark, it's raining, and I know I'm going down. And I got about two seconds to make a decision. Either I'm going to land on my four-year-old, or I'm going to take the fall and turn her and throw her in the grass. And I picked number two. And when I got in the side, I could feel the blood running down my shin. And uh, I sit down on the bed, man, and guess what happened? The body of Christ, the body of Christ. My wife, she got the ointment, she got the gauze, and I was real concerned about my shin, you know. 
I didn't say, well, you're just a shin. <laughs> no. My mind. This hurts. My eyes, how bad is it? Sharla, doctor this thing up, but we don't have any gauze. We'll make one out of some toilet paper. Do what you got to do. Let's get this thing. She's, she's, got the, she's got the paper towels on it, you know, and, and she's wrapping it up, man. And then at night I can't sleep because I sleep on my left side, and it's right here on my left side. And I'm, I'm trying to lay on that thing, and my whole body was involved for the one part. You are very important to the body of Christ. We have to work together. Listen, we should be depending on each other like that. My shin would not have been, would have been a lot of trouble if it wasn't for the rest of my body and my wife. The church is likened to a body, friend. We are connected to each other just like that. Listen to me. Don't you miss this. There is no place in the Bible, there is no place in the first century church, there is no place for a lone ranger Christian on their own, outside of the body of Christ. There is no such thing as an independent person walking with God, doing their own thing, biblically being obedient without a local church in the Bible. If you believe the Bible I preach, then you have to agree tonight that the body is one part of many members. Tony Evans says it best. He says, you don't have to go home to be married. But it's definitely going to cause you a rift in your relationship if you don't go home. Amen. Same with the body, same with the local church. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But it's going to damage your fellowship without being involved in a local church around other Christians. Listen, when one member suffers, Paul says here in the scripture, we all suffer with it. Just like my shin. I can't help but think about that thing. We depend on each other. My second point, we depend on each other. I want to tell you, Christian, tonight, do you realize we need each other? We desperately need each other. You heard Paul, 41 years old, never had a car, never had more than $200 in my, in my bank account. Never, 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 never did this, never did that. N couldn't stay off drugs, couldn't stay out of prison. Now what? Now he's, he's, uh, he's running a part of a dealership. He's got, he's got a savings account. He's got money put up. He's got a vehicle. He's got a license. He's got a local church. He's got discipled. He loves the word of God. He's pouring into other men. How did that happen? He didn't do it by himself. It took the local church. No one body part can make it without the other parts of the body. To those who serve in the kitchen, we need you. We need you. To those who serve in the child care, if you've got bad little kids, you need to say amen. <laughs> we need you. We need the child care. Think about what would happen if there was no child care tonight in this place. You wouldn't be able to focus on me for one second. Your kids would be running all over the place, climbing the walls in here. Amen. My little girl will be right in front of the whole pack doing the same thing. I understand. I'm very thankful for the child care. Those who drive the vans, you don't have to show your hands, but if you've, got, if you've got a ride in a van tonight, I want you to know somebody in the body of Christ from the local church picked you up, brought you here, took a Saturday away from their family. They're going to be here, and they're going to be the last ones to go home from this entire place, and they're not up here preaching the gospel. And if you're a giver tonight, we need you. Because if it wasn't for givers, we wouldn't have eight shuttles and a big old bus out there, insured, full of gas, worked on, fixed, make sure that you can get picked up and you can hear the word of God. It's because people gave and supplied the need so we could have a van. The media broadcasting this, the slides that are being shown, the treatment center, people who visit the treatment centers, people who sort the clothes so you can get some clean clothes and go look for a job. It's all together, guys. One body working together. We depend on each other. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing. There's a unity word. That there be no division, no schism among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and have the same judgment. What happens if the member of the body becomes independent? You say, I don't know. Cut your arm off and find out. It dies. We cannot be independent Christians. We are not dependent tonight. We are mutually dependent. We mutually depend on each other 
to do what God has called us to do. We need each other. Instead of competing with each other, how about you do this? How about you champion somebody? Instead of being jealous of somebody, why don't you encourage that person you're jealous of for what they got and what God's done in their life? Hey, someone's doing good, cheer them on. Encourage them. I love what Mark Twain said. He said, I can go a month on a compliment. Man, encourage them, lift them up. That's Christian right there. Look, Paul talks about one person being honored in the body of Christ uh, above other members. Look what he says here. It's talking about unity in verse 26. If one member suffers, we all suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. The word honored means praised, and it means glorified. It means recognized. So what do they share? What does a person share whenever somebody's honored? It says, it says if somebody's honored, uh, you, you, rejoice in, you rejoice with them. You're not sharing the honor with them. If, you, if, you, if, you, if somebody gets recognized or you get lifted up, listen, I want to help as many people as I can get where God wants them to be, even if it's way past anything God's called me to be and do. I want to see people go where God's called them to go. Why do you think we're sending missionaries out? What do we do? We find the best people who show up and serve. Jason Blackshear will crawl through a bed of nails with no shirt on backwards if you ask him to to serve the Lord. He's here. He's faithful. His wife's here. She's faithful. She's got her little boy in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a walker, in a little baby thing, whatever it's called. She's got him in the kitchen cooking the food. They never leave. What do most pastors want to do with those kind of people? Keep them. The most faithful person you got, the most faithful people you got, Brad Denny, faithful man of God, serving the Lord. He would have stayed right here. Steve Cummings, all these other, Scott Bates, pastoring in Louisiana. Listen, the most faithful people, the most, uh, you know, the, the, those, that are, that, those that want to serve the Lord, those that show up to everything, those that got a calling on their life, most people want to build six flags over the church. Six flags over Jesus right here, man. Let's just keep doing it right here. Let's build a little bitty kingdom right here. No, 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 no. We want to take those people and send them out into the world so they can make a big, giant impact where God has them go and do this somewhere else. And this is what happens. When you have that big kingdom mentality and they are honored. Look, Josh Zunick is in Orlando, Florida, killing it. Killing it in Orlando, Florida, man. They got shuttles running, man. They're busting out the seams. They're pushing over 100 and something people on Saturday night just like that. We've had, we've had a volunteer uh, a night of giving, a volunteer uh, uh, a night of giving auction to fundraise so we can pay some stuff off. And we raised at the most in three or four years $70,000. Josh Zuniga had his auction and they raised like $200,000 the first night. I'm not jealous of Josh. I'm sharing with him. What am I sharing in? I'm not sharing his honor. I don't want his honor. I'm sharing his joy. I'm rejoicing with him. I'm rejoicing with him. I'm happy for him. If your head is crowned, your arms and legs aren't jealous. Man, we're together in the body of Christ. That's big kingdom stuff. If you have a victory, I'm celebrating that victory with you tonight. If you got a week clean off drugs, I'm celebrating that week clean off drugs with you tonight. If you get a promotion, if you get recognized instead of me, I'm celebrating. I have joy for you. I can't wait to see what God does in your life. Encouragement brings strong unity. And that happens when Christians realize we're not in competition with each other. I tell folks that give testimonies, man, they're ready to bash another program. They're ready to tear down somebody that did them wrong. They got something to say about that program down there they used to be in. And one of the things I tell them is we don't talk bad about other programs at Freeway Ministries. It does not edify the body. It doesn't do any good. We, we want to be an encouragement to the community. We don't want to cause division. We want to be big kingdom minded. Can you see a body being jealous of itself? We celebrate victories. We encourage each other. We lift each other up. It pushes you, man. It makes you want to come back again. It makes you want to come be a part of that. You know what happens when you have this attitude, guys? Listen, don't, I'm almost done. You say, man, you're a long-winded tonight. I got something to say. Just hang in there. 
When you have this kind of attitude, this big kingdom mentality, guess what happens? Rivalries disappear. They go away. Jealousy goes away. All of a sudden, there's no more competition. All of a sudden, there's no more envy and slander and murmuring and superiority, inferiority. And all of a sudden, people start working together. Because unity is a theme in this letter written to the church. And God wants his church to be unified like a body. A healthy body is marked by unity. And so is a healthy church. And in closing tonight, God put the church together to shock the world. By joining men and women under one roof in fellowship that have nothing in common but Jesus. People who would not be caught dead in the same place together. Now brothers and sisters, one common denominator and that's Jesus Christ. And I believe when, when people look inside side, side the windows of this ministry, through this crowd, they're, they're going to see exactly what I just said. People together on a Saturday night giving ed- evidence of the body of Christ, that Jesus Christ is alive. Tonight, are you suffering? Are you alone? You don't have to be. You don't have to suffer alone. You have people here who care about you. Get connected to the body of Christ. If you're not a Christian tonight and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, listen, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God is heard. Ephesians 6 says the word of God is a sword of the spirit. Hebrews says the word of God divides the spirit, the marrow gets in your soul. The word of God begins as you hear it to to divide your intentions of a thought, the discernment of your heart. What's happened tonight through the preaching of the word? People are under God's conviction. There's some of you tonight that never trusted in Christ. And I want to encourage you tonight as simple as this, that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, Never made a mistake, never got, never, never, never got in a hurry, never, never, never was late for anything, never learned anything. He came to this earth, God the Son. He, he lived a sinless life and he fulfilled all the laws you broke. He went to the cross as a sacrifice for your sins and he, he gave himself for you. No man taketh his life, but he lays it down for his brethren. And he died on a cross and he rose again as your sacrifice. God has one way to be reconciled to him. One way, you've offended God. You're a lawbreaker, just on a thought level even. The only way you can make things right with a, with a holy God tonight is if you'll accept his son, Jesus. And tonight you can do that and become born again, like Jesus said to Nicodemus. How can a man understand the things of God unless he's born again? And tonight, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I have people down here that will pray with you. We're going to give what's called an invitation. And that's just a time for you to come and take a walk down the aisle as, I, as, as the song plays. And I'm going to pray. Would you stand with me tonight? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray as our worship team comes. And there's going to be people down here that will pray for you. Altar workers, would you come? They've got Bibles in their hands. We've got counseling rooms in the back. Hey, are you suffering tonight? Are you like Paul and like me, man? You don't have nobody. I remember doing my, my prison sentence, and I never, got a, I, never got a, I never got a letter and never made a phone call from anyone I knew. I had no home plan. I had no clothes to wear out of prison, man. There was a donated box from some kind of a place like us that gave clothes to prisoners. And there was four guys in there and me, and they picked what they wanted. By the time I got in there, man, I had clothes that didn't fit, buttons missing. But God had something for me in the body of Christ. Hey, there's a church that loves you. There's people here that welcome you tonight. You don't have to suffer. Listen, street credit, can't even, you, can't even get a, you can't even get a gas station soda at the filling station with street credit. It's worthless. Drop your pride tonight. Would you do that? Would you surrender that pride tonight? Would you let go of all that macho stuff and get real with God? Do you know God? Do you know Jesus is your Savior? Have you been born again? If not tonight, would you come and respond to this invitation and trust in Christ as your Savior? Maybe you don't have a local church. You want to come talk to somebody about getting plugged into church. Maybe you've been offended because somebody said something you didn't like. Maybe they had a bad day. And you left the church. and You, ain't, you haven't been right ever since. Maybe you need to come to this altar and say, God, forgive me for being so offended at the church you died for. Your bride. I'm going to make it a point to go back to that church. Apologize to that pastor and get back plugged in again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. I don't want to stand up here tonight and pretend like 
you should never leave a church because there's some churches that you need to leave. But God, we can make this gospel thing all about us, about what, what suits me and pleases me. And that's not your word, Lord. Your Bible says to die to yourself, to lose your life, to find it. And Father, if there's somebody here tonight that needs to go to a church they left from and talk to the pastor or make things right with somebody, God, would you, would you just convict them? God, if there's somebody here tonight that is lonely and broken and suffering and they're doing this thing in the world all on their own, I, have, I can't imagine that. God, would you bring them down here to this altar to meet with somebody? And if there's somebody here tonight that doesn't know Jesus, there's a man tonight in this room that if he died right now, he'd know he'd split hell wide open. They don't have to leave this place like that, Lord. We can nail it down tonight. If there's a woman here tonight that needs to trust in Christ, God, would you bring that woman down here to meet with one of our altar workers? We'll give you the praise and the glory for what great things you're going to do in just a moment. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin to sing, if God is speaking to you, I wonder if there's somebody here tonight that says, that's me, that you'll step out right now. I wonder if there's a woman here tonight that's not right with God and you need to reconcile that. Would you come? Is there one here tonight that's lonely? Is there one here tonight that's suffering all alone? We'll suffer with you tonight. As we sing, if God convicts your heart, please respond to that conviction and come.
continue just to extend this for just a moment. I've got guys and gals in ministry today that came and responded to God on the second invitation. You know, when, when we fall under conviction, we get prideful, don't we? Many times we'll stiff arm God for different reasons. I understand. But if God is tugging your heart and God has spoken your heart for something, if you're here tonight and you need to surrender your life to Jesus like she just sung, and come to this altar and say, Lord, have your way in me. I like what Isaiah said. Here I am, Lord. <laughs> Send me. Sign a blank contract with God. Put your name on it. And say, fill it out. You're calling me, Lord. I feel you calling me, Lord. I'm here. I surrender. If God is speaking to you tonight, we're going to give a short invitation one more time. I'm praying to God that there's one person in this room right now that needs to be saved. You trust Christ as your Savior. And if you're here tonight and you're unsaved and you're not right with God, you know it. You know it. And so I'm going to pray for you. And I pray that you will come, brother. I pray that you would come, sister. And you'll find one of these all to work with. You'll say, I need to make things right with God tonight. Father, thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for your word that penetrates the soul. And I ask God for every man, woman, boy, and girl in this building, if there's somebody here not right with God, that tonight would be the night where they trust in Christ. Would you have your way in here, Lord? Holy Spirit, would you work? Convicting and drawing. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And as we sing one last time, and we give this last invitation, if God has stirred in your heart, as we sing, you come. Down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, I'm desperate for you. Oh.